So I want to talk to you a little more about the kinetic molecular theory of gases. What this basically says is that the macroscopic properties of a gas, like the pressure or the volume or the temperature, are just a result of the microscopic properties of the gas molecules, like the position and the speeds of these molecules. So V down here is speed, V up here is volume. The idea is this gas is made of molecules, they're flying around in certain directions, they have certain speeds, and if you knew those speeds and you knew the distribution of speeds and the positions in here, you could figure out these macroscopic properties. What I want to basically do in this video is try to figure out what is the relationship. If we know the microscopic properties, how could we predict the macroscopic properties? Like if I knew the speed of all these molecules, how could I figure out what pressure would be in there? Or vice versa, if I knew the temperature of the gas, could I say what the average speeds are of these molecules in this gas? That's what we're going to do. But first we have to make a few assumptions. One assumption is that these molecules don't really interact. And if they do interact, it would only be because of a collision. And if there is a collision between these molecules, we have to assume it's elastic. And kinetic energy will be conserved and momentum will be conserved. Similarly, if one of these molecules strikes the wall of the container, and has a collision there, that should also be elastic. There should be no kinetic energy lost. So then let's get to it. Let me just clean that up, get rid of that, and start over up here. I need to figure out how to relate a microscopic quantity to a macroscopic quantity. Let's just start with speed. Let's say you've got a particle in here, a molecule moving this way with some speed. I'll call it Vx since I've drawn it in the x direction, and it collides with this wall. Well, that's going to impart a force on this wall. And if you get a lot of these doing that in here, you'll get a pressure on this wall. But it's going to be an elastic collision. So this particle is going to bounce backwards with the same velocity. And let's try to figure out what force that would exert. Because if I can figure out the force on the wall, I can figure out the pressure. Because pressure is just force per area. So force, yeah, it equals ma, but it also equals delta p, the change in momentum over the change in time. So this is an alternate way to write Newton's second law. What would be the change in momentum? So I'm going to try to find, find the force on this wall. The change in momentum, momentum is mv, and if this mass doesn't change, then change in momentum is just m delta v, where the v here is speed. So mass times, sorry, excuse me, velocity. Mass times change in velocity. So what would be the change in velocity? For this collision right here, it struck the wall and bounced back with the same speed. Some people want to say zero, because it comes in with the same speed that it goes out with. But V is velocity, and so the change in velocity is actually two times V. Because it came in with V, it left with negative V. So technically the change would be negative 2V. But I'm going to ignore negatives because I just want the size of this force on this wall. So M times 2 times Vx over delta T. But I don't want delta t in here. So how can I get rid of delta t? Well, I know the distance in here. Let's just call the side lengths here l. So say we have a box of l by l by l to cube. Well, the time it takes between collisions. So there's an impulse here, m delta v, right when this collision takes place. And then this particle travels over here to the left, bounces off of this wall, then comes back over to here, again hits it. How long is it between those impacts? Well, the time it would take to travel to the left and back I know speed is distance per time, so the time, the delta t, is just going to be the distance per speed, and the distance is not just l, because it's got to travel to this wall and then back. I want to know the force on this wall over here. I need to figure out how long is it between collisions with this wall, so it's going to be 2 times l over the velocity in the x direction. That's what I can substitute in over here. And I get that F is going to be M times 2 Vx over, delta T now is 2L over Vx. But since I'm dividing by Vx on the bottom, I moved that up top. And look, I've already got one here, so I'm just going to square it. I can cancel off the 2s, and I get that the force on the wall by this particle is mass times its velocity in the x direction squared divided by L. I should say this particle doesn't have to just be going in the x direction. It might have some total velocity this way where the x component is just a part of it. But if I just took the x component of the particle speed, whatever, whatever particle it is, it had some velocity, the x component, I'd get the force contribution to the pressure on this wall over here. So this is the force. 
on this wall over here by one particle, but I want to know the force from all the particles because I want to get the total pressure. So how could I do that? Well, if I want the total force, I just need to add up the contributions from all the particles. So let's say there was there were other particles. Well, they're going to have the same mass m. I'm assuming I got the same gas throughout. All molecules have the same mass, and the L will be the same for all of them. So the only difference in contribution will be that some may have a certain component of velocity in the x direction. I'll call this Vx1 squared. Plus, there may be some other particle that has a different component, 2, and there may be some particle that has a different component, 3. You just have to add all these up. So I'll have Vx2, the two references, particle 2 squared plus Vx3, the x component of particle 3's velocity squared plus, I'd keep going to n many times. I'd keep adding this up until I got, what, Vxn, the nth particle, total amount. If there's n particles in there, squared. But this is looking like an average. In fact, if I just divide both sides by n, the total number of particles, look at what I get. I get that force over n equals m divided by l times this whole thing divided by n is just the average value. The average value of what? The average value of vx squared, and it's the average value of vx squared. So I'm going to put a bar over the top of this. This is telling you that it's the average value of vx squared. It's not the square of the average values of vx. That's different. So if I took the averages of all the vx's, vx1 plus vx2 plus vx3, divide by n, and then square it, I'd get a different result. So it's important to note, first you square them all, take the average, and that's what you're doing here. You're taking the average of the squares, not the square of the average. Okay, so moving on, we get that f equals n times m over l, the average value of vx squared but what do we want to do with this? I promised you a relationship between speeds and pressure, so let's turn this into pressure. Let's figure out what's the pressure on this area here. So I have to turn this into a pressure. That's not too hard. Pressure is just force per area. So I could just divide this by the area of this wall. So I'll divide, if I divide the left side by area, I've got to divide the right hand side by area as well. What does that leave me with? On the left-hand side, I get pressure, that's good, a macroscopic variable, equals n times m times vx squared, averaged over all the gas molecules, divided by a times l. But a, what's a? a is just l squared. So I get l squared times l on the bottom, that's just l cubed, and look at what's going to happen. l cubed, that's just volume, that's the volume of this cube, and so I get n the number of molecules times m, the mass of one of the molecules times the average value of the x component squared over all the gas molecules divided by v. That's the volume. We're getting close. This is looking like the ideal gas law, so this is really good. Let me just take this result, actually, and just put it in a new window so we can get a clean result. And look at what I get. I get that the pressure times the volume, if I multiply both sides by v, pressure times volume equals the number of gas molecules times m times the average squared x velocity in the gas. So this is pretty cool. If I went out and measured the pressure of a gas and the volume of the gas, I could try to figure out now what the average squared x components of velocity are for the gas. That's a microscopic quantity. We've got a relationship now. But, I mean, I don't just care. Like, I'm not trying to just single out x. There's y and there's other directions in here. Why would we want an equation with just the x? Usually you just want a formula. It'd be better if this just told us the total average squared velocity. So let's do that. If this is in the x direction, I had velocity in the x, but these particles also have velocity in the y direction. And so the total, we know the total, v total, would be vx squared plus vy squared, and there's also one more. We live in three dimensions. There we go. v in the z direction. So this is the Pythagorean theorem in three dimensions. It works in three just as well as it does in two. But this equation works also if I average them all. If I took all the averages of the x squared components of velocity, and I took the average of all the vy squared components of velocity, so if I take these all and I average them, well, this equation's still true. Oops, this should have been squared. Oh my goodness, this v total here should have been squared right there. I take the average. Now, 
I'm going to make a claim. I'm going to claim that the particles in here are flying around randomly. There's no direction that's singled out. There's no preferred direction. They have just as much velocity on average in every direction as any other direction. So really, V in the x direction squared averaged over all the gas molecules has to be equal to V in the y direction squared, because why would it be any different? Why would Y be preferred than X? I mean, on average, if you had a lot of gas molecules, these have got to basically, statistically be, even VZ has got to be equal, the average of those squares, these have got to be equal. So you may as well write this down here as three times one of them. So three times VX squared averaged, because I already have that one up here, and now I can this is a way I can get V total in here. I want V total, not just one direction. And so I get Vx squared averaged over all the gas molecules equals, I'm just gonna divide both sides by three here, and I get V total squared averaged over all the gas molecules divided by three. This is cool. Now I can substitute this into there, and I'll get a relationship that says that P times V, P times V equals the total number of gas molecules times the mass of one gas molecule times the average of the total squared velocities divided by three. And I'm gonna rearrange this just a little bit more. I'm gonna say that, let's multiply both sides by three. I'll get that three times PV equals N times M times the average of V total squared for all the gas molecules. And I'm gonna do one more thing. I'm gonna multiply both sides by one half. You might think that's random, but I'm doing this for a reason. Check this out now. Look at what we got over here. This whole term right there, one half m v squared. This should look familiar. This is just the average kinetic energy of one of the gas molecules. This is awesome. This says, if I knew the pressure and the volume, then I've got a way to figure out what's the average kinetic energy of one of these gas molecules. This gives me a direct relationship between the kinetic energy of a gas molecule, or the average kinetic energy, and what the macroscopic pressure and volume are. It's so important that I'm gonna write it again. What we found was that the three halves times the pressure times the volume equals N times the average kinetic energy of a gas molecule. What can we do with this? We can do a few more things. P times V, I know what P times V is. Remember, the ideal gas law, PV equals capital N, kt. So I can substitute in nkt over here and I'll get that three halves times capital nkt equals capital N average kinetic energy. Well these n's cancel and I get a direct formula that the average kinetic energy in a gas, the average kinetic energy of one single gas molecule equals three halves kbt. This is nice. It tells me that directly if I know the temperature I can directly figure out the average kinetic energy of one of these gas molecules. No matter what kind of gas I have, as long as it's an ideal gas, that's pretty cool. Something else that's useful is, this is the average kinetic energy of one gas molecule. This is N, all of the gas molecules, the total number of them. So this whole thing right here is the total energy, the total thermal energy of that gas if it's monatomic, if the gas molecule isn't diatomic, if it's a single, simple, monatomic gas. All it's got is kinetic energy. That's the only energy it can have, and so 3 halves PV is the total energy of the gas, or you can write it as 3 halves N kt would be the total internal energy or if you wanted to three halves little n rt equals the total internal energy these are really useful to know but they're only true for a monatomic ideal gas a monatomic gas where the molecules that make up the gas are composed of only a single atom like helium or neon or any of the noble gases if you have a monatomic ideal gas these formulas give you a direct relationship between the macroscopic quantities and the total internal energy of that gas. These are particularly useful and it's useful to note that by total internal energy for a monatomic ideal gas, that's just a fancy word for the total kinetic energy. See, people used to think these were different energies. Remember, people thought maybe it was thermal energy, something new, something different. Nope. Boltzmann told us that's just kinetic energy in there for the most part, and for a monatomic ideal gas, it's only kinetic energy in there. So U total is just another word for the total kinetic energy, but when we talk about thermal systems, you'll often hear it referred to as the total internal energy of the gas.